Hello, Mr. Morgan. Thank you for being here. It is truly such an honor and a privilege to be sitting here with you at the beautiful Audain Museum in Whistler, British Columbia, Canada. I want to acknowledge that this interview is taking place on the shared unceded territory of the Squamish Nation and Liwa Nation. How are you doing today? I'm great, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here, this is incredible. Yes, so Mr. Morgan, you are the founder of M3 Entertainment, which is a music management company primarily focused on producers and also the president of OVO Sound. And you have been at the forefront of helping Canadian artists break through to the world stage. So let's start from the beginning. Where did you grow up? I actually uh, grew up in, on a small farm with my family just outside of Toronto. So how did you get the name Mr. Morgan? Uh, I began DJing uh, in high school. Mm -hmm. And after high school, I started uh, DJing at a small lounge. And initially, it was really only a few people there. But as the night started to get a little more popular, people kept saying, you need a DJ name. Mm -hmm. A friend suggested the name Captain Morgan, playing off of the rum, uh, which I started with. But after a few weeks, the night became increasingly popular. And a few different people suggested to me that Captain Morgan wasn't uh, the greatest character. And mm -hmm. I should maybe look into that. So once I look in, looked into him, decided that's definitely not the name I want to lead with. Uh, and the same friend said, well, what about Mr? Mm -hmm. Went with Mr. and uh, it stuck with me to this day. You know what? I think you made <laughs> the right choice. Agreed. I can only imagine the incredible journey that you've been on from DJing in Toronto and now working with the biggest artists in the world. How did your career in music begin? Uh, when I look back, I think DJing was uh, the main thing that I'd say as far as my career, I always had a passion for music. Mm -hmm. I listened to music nonstop. I talked about new music nonstop. I always wanted to share music with people. And um, at the time, as anyone else would do, I, I applied for college. I applied for a business course because I didn't really know what else to uh, mm -hmm. apply for. <clears throat> I was accepted and then I told, um, I, I was telling someone about it. Uh, they asked me if I was, what I was going to school for. Yeah. And when I told them business, they said, why would you go to business yeah. school? All you ever talk about is music. Uh, this, was a, this was a friend of a close friend of mine. And they said, you, you know, have you, heard, have you heard about this school? There's a school, Harris Institute for the Arts in Toronto, which I didn't know about. Uh, it was a music business and recording arts management school. I immediately looked it up, applied, I got in. But the big thing that happened from there was uh, there was an internship program. We had to find an internship. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted that internship to be meaningful. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine at that time uh, introduced me to this woman who was the entire international wow. department for Jive Records in New York. And she came to Toronto. I met with her, uh, told her I wanted to intern with her. She said, hey, if you can make it to New York, and as long as it's part of a school program, no problem, come on down. Um, that led me to going to New York for an internship. I interned, went back to Toronto uh, with the intention of getting a job at a record company because that was kind of all I knew. Yeah. And I kind of thought that was the end all and be all. I applied at most of the record companies in Toronto, did not get a job. Oh my goodness. I still have the rejection letters <laughs> through staying in contact with people I'd met in New York, yeah. um, I continued to have conversations. And one of those people, uh, which truly ended up being the most meaningful connection it could be, he was at the company that I had interned at and let me know that he would be starting his own company wow. and that if I wanted to come back to New York, he mm -hmm. could offer me at least a paid internship to start. And that led me back to New York and really being there to this day. Wow, that's amazing. It really sounds like one opportunity led to the next and meaningful yeah. connections were pivotal to your career Absolutely. early on. Talk to me about the creation of M3 Entertainment. Uh, as far as M3 with producers, I found as I was helping artists put records together and paper records to release records, 
I ended up dealing with a lot of the producers. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of young producers who didn't know what to do. And as you need an, an agreement in order to release the music with an artist, um, I felt that there was, a, there was a need for these producers to have some type of uh, representation or someone looking out for their best interest. Uh, Super Dupes, again, another close friend of mine, he was a big DJ at the time. I was a huge fan of him as a DJ, big reggae DJ, black Chinese. He was making tracks on his mixtapes and didn't really realize that he was producing. Wow. And I helped him at that time kind of recognize that he was actually producing and putting those things together. Uh, similarly, similarly with 40, 40 was producing all this music and putting all this stuff together for Drake. And because Drake rose so quickly, most of the things for him were kind of taken care of because everyone mm -hmm. had his best interest in mind. Um, our, as our relationship grew, I started putting things together for him and helping and he was like, wow, this is amazing. Like, well, this is what a manager does. Mm -hmm. He just didn't have someone handling those things. And our relationship grew through that. Uh, 1985, who I manage, uh, was someone I, I thought had incredible talent. He actually knew Forty and Drake before I did. Um, I just reconnected them. And I think they recognized what he was doing, um, which then led on to records that he produced, such as Hold On, We're Going Home, mm -hmm. Hotline Bling, and One Dance. Uh, also, Vinyls is a major part of my uh, roster. Is just someone I just, one of my favorite beat makers I've ever heard. And I just felt like he had so much potential and just, he just needed more self-confidence to continue doing what he's doing and be able to handle his business and let him just can entirely focus on being creative. And th those were the pieces that really formed the, the management aspect or the production management aspect of M3. Amazing, that's incredible. I, I think the creation of M3 Entertainment really speaks to your entrepreneurship because you were able to identify a need in the market and you took it within your own hands to create a solution and which has helped so many artists, artists and has helped you know, manage producers as well, right? Um, it's evident you've always been so passionate about the advocation for Canadian artists. Why did it mean so much to you? I think that uh, the main thing was just, I just felt there was so much talent uh, in Toronto and Canada as a whole, but that people didn't know about. <clears throat> While people in, in New York were having so many conversations about all the artists in New York, mm -hmm. uh, there was something else. My conversation was a different conversation, mm -hmm. and not everyone was willing to, to jump on everything, but I was able to put things on the radar and find places where they could have a moment or have find a, a shining moment to get some exposure yep. and through that uh, in particular it led to uh, a couple of those artists being signed uh, to major labels um, mm -hmm. it also that my complaining about not enough being done led to me uh, being offered a job at one of the labels talking about canadian artists on a global stage undoubtedly drake is at the top how did your connection with him form? Uh, my connection with Drake, uh, I guess, was in probably late 2007, early 2008. Um, at the time, over the years, uh, particularly from Toronto, uh, artists and managers uh, would, would always stay in contact with me just to find ways to get heard or get experience in New York. One of them was, um, uh, who's a good friend of mine to this day, Lo, mm -hmm. who was a young manager at the time and sought me out and said, hey, could I intern with you uh, if I came to New York? I said, if you can get to New York, you yeah. absolutely can. So he made his way down and we started spending a bunch of time together and he, through conversations, uh, asked me if I knew about Drake. Mm -hmm. I knew about Drake from acting. I didn't, really didn't know much about his music at that time. Um, Drake then came down to New York, uh, to meet with, with us, uh, spend time, get to know each other. Um, he would come, we had a small office inside the Shady Records office at the time. He would come spend time uh, there alongside uh, Future the Prince, who was mm -hmm. his DJ at the time. And we just started building a relationship at that time. Um, it was also the time where I was, what I felt was, was having my first true 
breakthrough moments. Mm -hmm. uh, I was managing Cardinal Fischel, who have, was having his first true hit record with uh, Dangerous featuring yeah. Akon. I was a and at Atlantic Records uh, with uh, a and Estelle, who is having her first true breakthrough record with American Boy featuring Kanye, uh, as well as working with Sean Paul. Mm -hmm. So for me, I felt like I was really, truly getting my foot in the door. And, uh, and sitting with Drake, it was, it was exciting to meet him. Uh, he had um, an unbelievable vision for where he was headed for, far before anything had actually happened. Yeah. Uh, and we just, we just stayed in, in contact during that time, but he, a, a, a very extremely meaningful connection that happened there was he introduced me to Noah Forty Should Be, mm -hmm. who is one of my closest friends uh, I also manage and business, business partner with. And we grew very close during that time. And I think between uh, 40, Drake, and Future, we really started to build a relationship. And not long after that, things really took off for him. Um, you know, they released So Far Gone mm -hmm. in early 2009. And we just, we all stayed in touch during that time. I think a big part of it was being a familiar face and someone from the same place as them, there was always an ability for to run things by each other and have a perspective um, for someone familiar. From from that point, how did you get involved with OVO Sound? So OVO Sound did not exist at that time. OVO did, which was October's very own, mm -hmm. which was Drake, Forty, and Oliver, um, and that was their movement. That was where. Things were presented through the, the OVO blog. Um, they'd release music there. They'd post anything they were interested in there. And as things continued to de develop and picked up pretty quick, because Drake made an incredible impact worldwide, um, we started having some conversations about, hey, start a record company. Mm -hmm. uh, but it hadn't actually happened. Um, and it was, uh, I guess, late 2010 going into 2011 that uh, Oliver shared some music on the OVO blog from an unknown artist at the time named The Weeknd mm -hmm. and then Drake ended up posting or tweeting um, a link to The Weeknd's music something he had never done in pointing to an artist before and um, which was a big moment but even bigger that the music that he pointed to was as good as he said it mm -hmm. was. And it created a huge moment and it definitely introduced The weekend to the world. And my conversation with everyone was, yeah. this is sort of what a record company does yeah. uh, or strives to achieve. Mm -hmm. And through that conversation, we talked about, hey, we should really try to put something together. And they agreed uh, and I think it was 40 that said, well, we could do this, but we're definitely going to need you to run this. Yep. And I think what I loved and saw and recognized in what they were doing, they were operating with no regard for the music business. Mm -hmm. They were making music, they were making art, they were putting it out free. They are just putting it yep. out to the world. And I felt that if I could apply what I knew and how to kind of organize and structure that without interfering with their vision, we could really be a platform for introducing artists, which led to uh, introducing the world to Party Next Door, mm -hmm. Maja Jordan, Roy Woods, Division, mm -hmm. and so on. And that's where OVO Sound really was born. That's awesome. From that now, OVO Sound is a household name around the world. You have had some legendary music moments. Is there one that stands out for you? Uh, there, there's a lot of moments. Um, I think one that stuck out uh, earlier on was in 2005. Um, a good friend of mine who I'd met early on and when I got to New York, uh, we'd always stayed in touch. He came to me say that, letting me know that he had a young artist from Barbados he was developing and putting a package together to present to record companies. Mm -hmm. So he came to me, asked if I could help out. I said, no problem, and he went and uh, kind of famously at this point took a meeting with Jay-Z mm -hmm. uh, and the artist turned out to be Rihanna. Uh, wow. They did one meeting and signed the record contract that day. From there he said, I really need you to help 
set this record up and set her up. Um, she had a record called Pond the Replay, uh, which I had been working with a lot of reggae artists and records at the time. And my point was, don't put this out as a Def Jam release. Mm -hmm. Don't put, send this out to pop radio. Let's get this out to people and make it feel like it's a record coming from the Caribbean. Although it was a very pop leaning record, <clears throat> I gave the record to a good friend of mine, Cypher Sounds, who was a DJ at Hot 97, and then sent the record out to reggae DJs across the country. And uh, it took off pretty quickly from there. Uh, it also led to my first meeting with, with Jay-Z, and kind of everything I described happened in that moment. Um, and it definitely felt like overnight, um, and it sparked this huge moment, and she went on to flourish to become the Rihanna and the world knows today. That's absolutely remarkable. I'm sure there are so many kids watching this interview. So to the next generation of kids out there that want to be an artist, a producer, a manager like yourself, what would your advice be? Uh, meaningful connections and building relationships. Uh, for me, uh, that's been everything for me uh, from the very beginning, just there's uh, a lot of people that I met from in the very early days that I'm still extremely close with mm -hmm. to this day and I've had you know various jobs or positions throughout these years we've known each other and I think um, having th there's never not an opportunity to learn yeah and I think uh, through relationships um, you know there's a lot of young artists there's, there's more young artists and managers having uh, successes quicker than, than ever these days. The hard part is getting the context of realizing that this is one moment, you can be hot this moment and not necessarily mm -hmm. the next. It's true. And those relationships that you build can help build and grow through all those kind of peaks and valleys throughout. Mm -hmm. It's very insightful to see how meaningful connections were key to your journey through the music industry. I think your legacy will undeniably inspire the next generation. So thank you so much for sitting down with us today. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.